Hello everybody and welcome to the channel. It's Polyester here and uh, the public test build for Chapter 14 DLC First Legacy came out today. So we're going to look at the lore of the killer and the survivor and touch on the perks and power a little bit and as well as the description of the map. So let's get started. So starting with the survivor here, her name is Yui Kimura. And we're going to read through her character info here for her backstory. Despite her traditional upbringing, Yui Kimura raced scooters in her hometown of Hida, where she earned the reputation of being able to do the impossible with very little. Her father did his best to steer her away from what he believed to be masculine pursuits, but her grandmother secretly shared her grandfather's engineer manuals and notes on car and motorcycle engines. Yui read her grandfather's manuals and learned fast. She was able to not only maintain her scooter, but she modified the engine so that she could compete with older boys on motocrosses. With her grandfather's good luck, Hachimaki, wrapped around her arm, she raced local boys who, unable to keep up with her, worked together to orchestrate her defeat. No luck for them. Yui outmaneuvered them at every turn and became a sensation to all her friends. When it came time to apply for school, Yui gathered her courage and confessed her ambition to race motorcycles to her father. An altercation ensued, and when Yui refused to apply for a proper education, her father felt a great shame and told her she was no longer welcome in their home. With a heavy heart, Yui left for Nagoya with the blessings and savings of her grandmother. Nagoya was not what Yui expected. She could only find low-grade clerical work or minor jobs as a hostess. With the last of the money her grandmother gave her, she purchased a racing bike and entered illegal street races where she won more money than she had ever seen. Rumors of her courage and quick reflexes spread like wildfire. Soon she had an unofficial ret retinue of women motorcyclists wearing Yui's signature pink. Along with a gang following her, Yui realized that she had a stalker following her in the shadows. When Yui realized her lucky handkerchief had been stolen from her apartment, she took her concerns to the police, who laughed and dismissed her, saying her stalker was probably a nice guy and that she would probably marry him in the future. One evening, Yui returned home to find the stalker in her apartment going through her things. He hadn't seen her, and she wasn't sure what she should do, but the sight of him going through her clothes was too much to bear. She yelled for him to leave. The stalker turned to her with a knife. He lunged at her. She evaded his attack, and he hit the wall and dropped the knife. Without hesitation, Yui tackled him. They rolled over the ground, exchanging desperate blows. Yui took more blows than she had ever experienced racing scooters in Chirakawa. With a surge of adrenaline, she managed to overpower her stalker, snatching the knife from the floor and holding the razor-sharp blade to his neck. When the police reached her apartment, they took him away and rushed Yui to the hospital for trauma. X-rays revealed she had broken her arm and foot in several places. It wasn't long before her gang showed up one by one, and together they helped her pay her medical bills. Rehabilitation was difficult, but Yui never gave up, and with the support of her gang, she was ready for the races. Yui's first race after the attack, her gang presented her with a new pink hachimaki with their signatures and good luck messages written all over it. Yui vowed she would help other women with her winnings and influence, and true to her word, her gang became known as the Sakura 7 Gang, and they wore pink hachimakis as a symbol of unity and support for women needing help from stalkers and abusers. Sakura 7 grew beyond the seven members and Yui's signature pink became synonymous with women's empowerment. At street races, women would line up in droves to support her. After winning seven straight races in a row, she attracted the attention of a sponsor. She not only earned a spot in the All Japan Moto Championship, but was the youngest woman to race and win in the prestigious event. Her sponsorship soon tripled. So too did her gang, but everything came to a staggering halt at the illegal TK3 the Tokyo Kick 3000 street races. Yui was leading the race until she entered an unnatural fog that seemed to have appeared from nowhere. Baffled and confused, she stopped her bike and dismounted, and it wasn't long before she realized she wasn't in Tokyo anymore. So now looking at Yui's three teachable perks, we have Lucky Break. You've had your share of scrapes and bruises, but luck's always on your side. Lucky Break activates anytime you're injured, and you won't leave trails of blood for a total of 120 seconds. Lucky Break is permanently deactivated for the remainder of the trial once the total duration has elapsed. So this is uh, level 1, 
Um, when you get up to level 3, it goes up to, I believe, 180 seconds. So it will be 120 seconds, 150 seconds, and 180 seconds at tier 3. By any means necessary, you stand up for yourself using whatever's on hand to gain an advantage. Press and hold the active ability button for 3 seconds while standing beside a drop pallet to reset it to its upright position. Any means necessary has a cooldown of 160 seconds before you can reset another pallet. I believe if you get this up to tier 3, that cuts it down to 120 seconds, so it would be 160, 140, 120 seconds for the cooldown to reset another pallet. And then we have Breakout for her third teachable perk. You kick into high gear when someone's in trouble, inspiring them to overcome any obstacle. When within 6 meters of a carried survivor, you gain a haste status effect, moving at 5% increased speed. The carried survivor's wiggle speed is increased by 20%. So if you're nearby um, a killer that's holding a survivor, you can give them a bonus in their wiggle time and you'll become a little bit faster so that you can maybe get to that hook and block it if you want to take a hit for that person to help them wiggle out. So uh, the base here is 5% increased speed. It goes 5, 6, or 7% increased speed at tier 3. Um, personally, of these perks, Lucky Break is probably my least favorite. Um, and I think by any means necessary is probably my favorite of these. I really like that one. This is a good one too, though, if you want to go into Survive with Friends with a really altruistic build, like if Metal of Man, you want to take protection hits, you want to help people wiggle off, that, that's a pretty good one too for that kind of a combo. Okay, now flipping over to the killer side, we have the Oni here, and we're going to read their character info. The Oni has a 4.6 meters per second base speed with a 32 meter base terror radius and they are considered tall. The difficulty in playing this character is considered hard. I think uh, Yui is an intermediate. I don't think these really mean much, but anyway, it's there. Character info for the Oni, the backstory. Honoring his family name was never enough for Kazan Yamaoka. I looked up how to pronounce it. That's the best pronunciation I could come up with. Kazan and Kazan Sorry, Kazan means volcano in Japanese. He wanted to surpass his father's reputation and end what he saw as the thinning of samurai culture with farmers often posing as a samurai. His father tried to turn Kazan's attention to more noble pursuits, but Kazan refused to heed his advice, and borrowing his father's katana, he embarked on a dark pilgrimage to prove his worth and rid Japan of imposters. Ignoring the code that had been taught to him, Kazan killed imposters in the hills and the valleys, on the beaches and in the woodland. The killings were brutal, cruel, and morbid. He humiliated farmers and warriors alike, yanking off their top knots and stripping them of their armor. His rage, bloodlust, and perverse sense of honor knew no bounds. Monks believed he was possessed by something dark and otherworldly and cursed him while a noble lord began to call him Oni Yamayoka, the rageful samurai, an insult both to Kazan and his family. Determined to redeem his family's name, Kazan now butchered anyone who dared call him Oniyamaoka. The insult confused him. He had defeated the best, and he had purified the samurai class by ridding the land of impostors. How could anyone refer to him as an ogre? Had it been because he had marched onto a battlefield to cut down the fiercest warriors? Had it been because he had taken a kanobo and dashed hundreds of skulls with it? Or had it been because of his need to secure a trophy from his victims? It didn't matter. Being called an ogre was more than he could bear, and an ominous voice in his head urged him to strike down the lord who had desecrated his name. As Kazan made for the lord's town, he suddenly found himself face to face with a samurai standing on a dirt road blocking his way. Kazan readied his kanobo. Without a word, the samurai attacked and quickly secured the upper hand, but he hesitated, and with a devastating blow, Kazan crushed the samurai's head and cracked his helmet. As Kazan approached the fallen samurai, he saw his father's face and staggered back to his haunches. His father stared at Kazan with mingled shame and regret as he issued his last breath. Kazan closed his eyes and screamed in agony until he could scream no more. When he opened his eyes again, his father was gone. Not only had he killed his father, but he had allowed thieves to steal his body for armor. Bitter, lost, and disillusioned, Kazan roamed the land aimlessly with his father's voice rattling in his head, taunting him, reminding him of his failures, sending him into fits of uncontrollable black rage. 
One day, walking in the woods, Kazan happened upon an Oni statue. He stopped and stood motionless for a long moment. The weathered and overgrown statue seemed to be ridiculing him, accusing him of being the imposter samurai he had so desperately sought to destroy. Kazan shook the laughing voice out of his head and half remembered the lord who had ridiculed him as Oni Yamaoka. With renewed anger, Kazan journeyed to a town high up in the snowy mountains where the lord resided. A dozen samurai met Kazan at the gates of the town. A dozen samurai fell to his kanobo. His speed and strength were unmatched. His rage was incomprehensible. Covered in blood and gore, Kazan battled through the town and soon found the lord hiding in a villa. He dragged him out of a cabinet, sliced his tendons to immobilize him, and watched him beg and squirm like a dog. Without hesitation, he thrust his fist into the lord's mouth and yanked out the wicked tongue that had desecrated his name. Satisfied, Kazan exited the villa to find himself surrounded by dozens of farmers wielding rusted scythes, sharp pitchforks, and heavy clubs. He survived the first few assaults, but there were too many attackers coming from every direction. Within moments, Kazan was on the ground staring at a cold, indifferent, darkening sky as farmers took turns stabbing and torturing the Oni who had butchered their beloved lord. The frenzied mob dragged Kazan into a small stone mill to continue the torture and finally left him to die a slow, agonizing death. And when they returned, the mill was filled with a, stretch, a strange black fog and Kazan's body and the Kanobo were nowhere to be found. It was the beginning of a dark legend about a rageful Oni haunting the town. So for the Oni's perks, we have the Zanshin Tactics unlocks potential in one's aura reading ability. You are mentally alert and aware of the key points in the battlefield. The auras of all pallets and vault locations are revealed to you within a 24 meter range. And when a survivor is damaged, this perk becomes inactive for 40 seconds. I'm assuming as you tear this up, the cooldown on this will reduce. This is basically a Windows of Opportunity version for the killer to see where the next pallet is. They're going to get stunned by, so not a favorite for me. I'm not a fan of um, Windows of Opportunity, but they can all be awesome perks, and this is basically Windows of Opportunity for killers. Next one here, we have the Blood Echo. The agony of one is inflicted on others. When hooking a survivor, all other injured survivors suffer from the hemorrhage status effect until healed and exhaustion status effect for 45 seconds. Uh, I'm assuming as you level this up, the status effect will last for a longer period of time. And then we have Nemesis. You seek retribution on those who have wronged you. A survivor who blinds you or stuns you using a pallet or a locker becomes your obsession. Anytime a new survivor becomes the obsession, they are affected by the oblivious status effect for 40 seconds and their aura is shown to you for 4 seconds. The killer can only be obsessed with one survivor at a time. So if you aren't the obsession and you stab them with the sights of strike and become the obsession, they're going to be able to see you for 4 seconds and you will have oblivious, you won't hear their heartbeat coming for um, 40, 50, or 60 seconds at tier 3, I believe. That's the way that one levels up. Now, for the killer's power called Yamaoka's Wrath. Yamaoka's Wrath, a desire to destroy weaker bloodlines shaped into a literal force. Absorb blood orbs left by your injured foes. Press and hold the power button to absorb blood orbs in the environment and fill your power gauge. When your power gauge is full, press and hold the active ability button to initiate Blood Fury. Blood Fury. While Blood Fury is active, the Oni becomes lethal and gains access to additional abilities, the Demon Dash and the Demon Strike. Special ability, Demon Dash. Press and hold the power button while Blood Fury is active to perform a Demon, at demon Dash. This ability allows the Oni to cover large distances rapidly. It's kind of like Chainsaw Billy zooming across the map. The Demon Strike Special Attack. Press and hold the attack button while Blood Fury is active to perform a Demon Strike in the direction you are facing. Demon Strike has an extended lunge range and successful hits immediately put healthy survivors into the dying state. So this is a one-shot ability and you can hit multiple people with it if they're grouped up in the same area. 
Now for the add-ons for the power here, I'm probably not gonna go through the second page because these are usually just lesser versions of what's on the first page. So we'll start off with the best ones. We have the Iridescent Family Crest. While Bloody Fury is active, missing a Demon Strike will cause all survivors within 12 meter radius will scream and reveal their current location to you. So it's like a built-in infectious fright if you miss your strike. Then we have Renjiro's Bloody Glove. The glove Renjiro held to his sternum following the strike dealt by his son. So that's the first ancestor is Renjiro Yamaoka. And then this is Kezan is the, the second ancestor actually. All survivors can see their blood orbs and a survivor's aura is revealed for six seconds when they come in contact with a blood orb. This is a pretty strong one. It's like whenever a survivor is stopping to heal or do a generator, if they're making a pool of blood, they're standing in their own blood orbs, you can see them across the map. It's a very strong add-on. Akito's Crutch. Crutch used by Kezan's son after falling from a tree. Considerably increase the movement speed of the Demon Dash. Lion Fang. Considerably increases the duration of Bloody Fury. Splintered Hull. Fragments of a ship that carried Renjiro Yamaoka. That's how we know they're the first ancestor because they came by boat to the land where the family residence estate is. Moderately increases the amount of blood orbs dropped by survivors, which is going to help you um, and get your power gauge full. Tear soaked Tanugi. Considerably decreases consumption penalty of Bloody Fury when picking up a survivor. An Ion Zen Talisman. Trinket given to Kazan at birth. Its powers are meant to protect his family from harm. Moderately increases movement speed of the Demon Dash while Bloody Fury is active. Scalped Top Knot. The Top Knot of a Samurai who questioned Kazan's honor. The roots cling to a thin strip of bloody skin. Ugh. Considerably increases activation charge rate to initiate Demon Dash while Blood Fury is active. Shattered Wakazashi, the fragments of an ancestral blade destroyed by Kazan in a fit of rage, moderately increases the passive recharge rate of Yamaoka's wrath. The Wooden Oni Mask, a mask that young Kazan bought to celebrate Setsuban. Its repulsively fanged mouth began haunting his nightmares. Slightly increase the amount of blood orbs dropped by survivors. Okay, so now we're starting to see some repeats here. Uh, Mak Yamaoka Sashimono moderately increases duration. Bloody Sash moderately increases movement speed while absorbing blood orbs. Child's Wooden Sword moderately increases the distance that blood orb auras can be detected. Chip Sai Hai, a baton that belonged to Renjiro stolen by Kazan upon his departure. Slightly increases duration of Blood Fury and in Ink Lion. All right. Second page here, we have Polished. I don't know how to say that. Medetai. Blackened Toenail. Cracked Sakazuki. Rotting Rope. and Yakuyoke Talisman. Oh yeah, so I forgot you could turn the killers around now in the custom game. And they gave the Oni the frosty eyes. So um, the plague also has the frosty eyes or frosty eye, I should say. So this is gonna be for the upcoming Winter Solstice event. We're gonna talk about what's coming out with the Winter Solstice event in another video with all of the cool uh, holiday sweaters that are coming out. And I uh, played a ton of this PTB today. Can't wait to play more tonight. Just wanted to go through the lore, introduce you to these characters. And thanks for watching. We'll see you next time. Take care of each other out there in the fog. Bye-bye.